Well, I have a question. I guess I'd like to know a little bit more about why you specifically chose the title, the master and the emissary. And yeah, that, that's to, uh, uh, in an attempt to explain what I believe to be the relationship between the two yeah. brain hemispheres. Um, that like most other things in life, they're unequal and asymmetrical. And that one of the brain hemispheres sees more than the other. That is the one that I've designated the master mm -hmm. and is the right hemisphere. Mm -hmm. That's but a weird inversion because people often think of the left hemisphere as the one that's like dominant. They do, they do. Traditionally that's been the case. Uh, but um, as is becoming ever clearer, the right hemisphere, ha this has been a, a real steep learning curve for some people, but the right hemisphere is in many ways more reliable, sees more, understands more than the left hemisphere, mm -hmm. which is like a, a sort of high-functioning high bureaucrat in a way. Mm -hmm. And the, the idea of the story was simply that certain matters needed to be delegated, not only because, as it were, the master couldn't do everything. He needed an emissary to go abroad and do some of it, but also that he must not get involved with a certain point of view, otherwise he'd lose what it was that he did see. So mm -hmm. that's what I'm really saying there, is that there's a good reason uh, why, evolutionarily speaking, the two brain hemispheres are separate. And when you say it doesn't get involved, what's the advantage of, of that, that detachment from the involvement? Well, it's that um, Ramoni Cajal, who you know yep. is a great histopathologist, yep. Um, one of his findings was that in primates there are more inhibitory neurons than in any other animals and there are more in humans than, than in any other primate. And um, there are many that, more... And that's propor speaking proportionally. Proportionally mm -hmm. and there are more kinds as well. So mm. we think that about 25% of the entire um, cortex is, is inhibitory. Right. So it's a very strong effect. And the corpus callosum seems to be um, very largely, in the end, inhibiting function in the other hemisphere. And that is, I think, because over time, the two hemispheres have had to specialize. Uh, there are reasons why actually it can't be, I'm not going to go into now, yeah. but I was talking about um, just a few days ago at the evolutionary psychiatry um, meeting. But there are reasons why the corpus callosum has had to become more selective and to inhibit quite a lot of what's going on in the other hemisphere because it enables the two to do distinct things. Mm -hmm. And of course they have to work together, but usually good teamwork doesn't mean everyone trying to do the same role. Right. So differentiation is very important for two elements to work together. And inhibition is one way of doing that. So effectively the two takes on the world, if you like, that the hemispheres have are not easily compatible right um, and we're not aware of that because at a level below consciousness there's a meta control center that is bringing them together so in ordinary experience we don't feel we're in two different worlds but effectively mm. we are mm -hmm. and they have different qualities and different goals different values different different um, takes on what is important in the in the world and what meaning or whatever it might have so so let me let me ask you about i've, I've got I've developed a conceptual scheme for for thinking about the relationship between the two hemispheres, and I'm kind of I've been curious about what you think about it and how it might map on to or not your your ideas. So I've been really interested in the orienting reflex, and right. discovered by Sokolov, I think, back in about 1962. Right, he was a student of Lurius, and the orienting reflex is manifested when something, at least in their terminology, something unpredictable happened. I've thought much more recently that it's actually when something undesired happened happens and right. the laboratory constraints um, obscured that and that turned out to actually be important but right um so and i, I kind of put together the ideas of the orienting reflex with some of the things i learned from jung jung's observations on the function of art and dreams right. so imagine that you have a conceptual scheme laid out right. and we could say that it's 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 linguistically mediated it's enforced on the world and then there are exceptions to that to that conceptual scheme, and yes. those are anomalies, those yes. are the anomalies. things that are unexpected, and the orienting reflex orients you towards those. Yes. And so those are things that aren't fitting properly in your conceptual scheme that you have to figure out. Yes. So the first thing you do is react 
defensively, essentially, yes, because it yes. might be dangerous. Yes. And then your exploratory systems are activated. Yes. So, and the exploratory systems, first of all, are enhanced attention, just yes. from an intentional yes. perspective. But then, and this is where the art issue sort of creeps into it, it's, the idea would be something like the right hemisphere generates an imaginative landscape of possibility that could map that anomaly. So you can kind of experience that if yep. it's at night, you know, like say yep. you're sitting alone at night, it's two mm. or three in the morning, you're kind of tired, um, maybe you're in an unfamiliar place and there's a noise that happens that shouldn't happen in another room. Yep. You can play with that. So for mm. example, if you open the door slightly and put your hand in to turn on the light mm. and you watch what happens, your mind will fill with imaginative representations of yes. what might be yes. in the room, yes. right? So it's like the, 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 the landscape of anomaly will be populated with yes. something like imaginative demons. Yes. And that's a first pass approximation. Yes. Yes. And it seems to me that that's a right hemispheric function. And then that as you explore further, that imaginative domain, which, which circumscribes what might be, is yes. constrained and constrained and constrained and constrained until you get what it actually is. Yes. And that's specialized and routinized. It's something yes. like that. Yes. Yes. Does that seem like a reasonable what do you think about that? As I a love that for, idea? for a whole ro host of reasons. Um, one is you mentioned uh, defense, and one of the uh, ideas behind my hypothesis is that the right hemisphere is on the lookout for predators, right. wh whereas the left hemisphere is looking for prey. And th this has been confirmed in many species of both. I'd never heard that second part. Amphibians and mammals, yes. Um, uh, so when you're in left hemispheric mode, you're more in predator mode, and when you're in right hemispheric well, mode, it, you're more it, in Well, I mean, of course, mode. we are not uh, lizards or toads or marmosets or whatever, but in animals, generally speaking, yeah. uh, this is the case. Getting and grasping, and after all, our left hemisphere is the one that controls sure, the grasping sure. hand, um, is left hemisphere, and uh, exploring, which you mentioned, yep. is more right hemisphere. And when the when a frontal function is deficient, um, people often go into automatic mode of the hand of that side. And with the left hand, it's usually exploratory motions, meaningless ones, but trying to explore the environment. And with the right hand, it's grasping pointlessly at things. So they, as it were, their automatic thing is with the, with the left hand, the right hemisphere to explore, with the right hand, the left hemisphere to grasp. So right. when you said exploratory and you said defensive and you said also opening up to possibilities, these are all aspects of the way the right hemisphere, I often say the right hemisphere opens up to possibility, right. whereas the left hemisphere wants to close down to a certainty. Right, right. right. And you need That's both a chaos of these. and order issue. Chaos and order. Yeah, yeah, exactly. and, and, you know, I loved in, in your talk, you talked about... Um, a chaos and, and order, but if I may say so, you seemed, and maybe you'd like to gloss that a little, you seem to suggest that it would be good, we can't get rid of chaos, but you seem to imply that it would be better if we could, whereas my view is that chaos and order uh, are necessary to one another, and there is a proper sort of um, harmony or yeah, balance. Well, yeah, well, okay, that, I mean, I think that's, that's as deep a question as you could possibly ask, I would say, good. in some sense. I mean, <laughs> some of the I would say there's a central theological issue there. And yes. the issue there is, the, you know, in, in Genesis, the proper environment of humanity is construed as a garden. Yes. And so I see that as the optimal balance of chaos and order. Because right. nature is, is flourishes and is yes. prolific and is chaotic. Yes. And then if you add harmony to that, you yes. have a garden. Yes. So you live in the garden. You're supposed to tend the garden. Okay, so now the garden is created. It's a walled space because yes. Eden is a walled space. It's yes. paradisa. It's a, it's a walled garden. That's it. Now, the thing is, as soon as you make a wall, you try to keep what's outside out, but you can't because mm. the boundaries between things are permeable. So if you're going to have reality and you're going to have a bounded space, you're going to have a snake in the garden. Yes. Now, then the question is, what the hell should you do about that? Should yes. you make the walls so high that no snake can possibly yes. get in? Or should, or should you allow for the possibility of snakes, but make yourself strong enough so that you can contend with them? Yes. And I think there's, there's an answer there that goes deep to the question of even maybe why, theological question of why God allowed evil to exist in the world. I agree with you. It's like, well, do you make people safe or strong? And yes. strong is better. And safe might not be commensurate with being. Like it might not be no, possible to no. exist and to be safe. Well, so, uh, our existence is predicated on the fact that we die, so well, it's well, never safe. Well, it's uh, certainly bounded, right? <laughs> yes. and, uh, yeah, I mean, yes. it, it, it's inevitably in 
wrapped up with yes. that sort of finitude. Yes. So there's this old, there's a lovely, lovely Jewish idea, an ancient idea. Yes. It's one of the most profound ideas I've ever come across. Yeah. And so it's a kind of a Zen cone, and, and here it is, is that, um, so it's a question about the classic attributes of God, mm. omniscient, omnipresent, and omnipotent. Mm. What does a being with those three attributes lack? Mm. I think, well, what kind of question is that? And the answer is limitation. Yeah. And the second answer is that's the justification for being. Yeah. Is that the unlimited lacks the limited. Exactly. And so exactly. the limited is us. For anything to come into existence, there needs to be an element of resistance. And so things are never predicated on one pole of what is always a dipole. Right. Um, everything is, has that uh, dipole. Yeah, it's like a structure. prerequisite for being. Uh, uh, it is, mm -hmm. and it's imaged in the yin yang idea. Um, but it seems to me very important, because in our culture we often seem to suppose that certain things are just good and other things are just bad, mm -hmm. and it would be good if we could get rid of the bad ones. But mm -hmm. actually, by pursuing certain good things that are good within measure too far, they become bad right. and so forth. Right. But I, I, let's go back to your anomaly thing, because uh, Ramachandran calls the right hemisphere the anomaly yes, detector. Yes, yes. And so I think that that's a very important point, because there are two ways you can react to an anomaly. One is to, um, and both have to be explored, one is to try and uh, prove that it's not really an anomaly and therefore you can carry on with things as normal. Yes, and the other is that's the hopeful, that's, that, that's that, what you hope will happen. That, that's, a, that, that's, the, that's the typical left hemisphere approach, it doesn't want anything to have to shift. Yeah. Um, and quite reasonably, you don't want to be chaotically shifting if you're onto a good yeah, thing. Yeah, it's too stressful. Exactly, exactly. It takes too much work. It, and you might actually be mistaken. Yeah, so, yeah, so yes, the, the, in a way it's perfectly correct to be wary, but it's not correct to be so wary that you blot out anomalies. And there's a lot of evidence, as yeah, I'm sure you know, that the left the hemisphere end. simply blots out everything that doesn't fit with its tape. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mm -hmm. see it, actually, mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. right, right. So it's, there's a hugely important element in the right hemisphere going, hang on, but there may be another way of thinking that will accommodate this better. And actually good science needs, yes, to be sceptical about anomalies, otherwise there'll be chaos, but it also needs to be able to shift yep. when, when an anomaly is Right. They're large enough. Right, right. Uh, or, or there are quite a lot of them and they don't really fit very well into this. Exactly. Yeah. Yes, yes. So there's, a, there's another observation that Jung made, which I love. I love this observation. He was trying to account for radical personality transformation. Right. And so his idea was this, and I think it's, it's, it's commensurate with the ideas of inhibition between the two hemispheres. So let's imagine the left is habitually inhibiting the function of the right to keep fear under control. It does that all sorts of ways. But so imagine that. The right is um, reacting to anomalies and it's aggregating them. Okay, the left can't deal with them, so the right is aggregating anomalies. And maybe that's starting to manifest itself in nightmarish dreams, for example. It's like, okay. oh, these anomalies are piling up. It's indication that you're mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. shifting sand. Mm -hmm. Well, so then imagine that the right hemisphere aggregates anomalies and then it starts to detect patterns in the anomalies. And so now it starts to generate what you might consider a counter hypothesis exactly. to the left's exactly. hypothesis. If that counter hypothesis gets to the point where the total sum, in some sense, of the anomalies plus the already mapped territory can be mapped by that new pattern, mm. then at some point it will shift if, yes. and the person will kick into a new yes. personality configuration. Yes. Yes. It's like a Piagetian stage transition, except more dramatic. It is, and what a Piagetian stage transition is also like, and subsumes both, is Hegelian uh, Aufhebung, the idea that um, a thing is opposed by something else, but when, it, when there is a synthesis, it's not that one of them is annihilated. Right. They're both transformed and taken up into the new whole, right. which embraces what before right, looked, is, like, okay. looked like an op okay. opposition. Right, right. Yes. Okay, so here, here's a question for you. you know, mm. um, when I read Thomas Kuhn, I was reading Th Piaget at the same time, and I knew that Piaget was aware of Kuhn's work, by the way. And, um, the problem I had with Kuhn and the interpretation, interpreters of Kuhn is they don't seem to get something, who, who, who interpret Kuhn as a moral relativist in some sense, yeah. they don't seem to get the idea of um, increased generalizability of, of plan. So let's say I have a theory and a bunch of anomalies accrue and I have to wipe out the theory. And so then I wipe out the theory and I incorporate the anomalies and now I have another theory. So yes. that's a descent into chaos, that's my estimation, that's okay. the old story. 
So the anomaly, yes. disruption is the mythical descent into chaos. Yes. And then you reconfigure the yes. theory with the chaos and you come up with a better theory. Yes. Okay, the, the question is why is it better? Mm. And the answer is, well, it accounts for everything that the previous theory accounted for, plus, plus the anomalies. Exactly. So there's progress. Always, yes. Yes, exactly. And yes. So, but Kuhn is often read as stating that there is no progress, that you know, there's incommensurate paradigms and you have yes. to just shift between yes. them, but, yes. but there isn't there isn't cumulative knowledge in some sense. Well, I think one thing that one we probably would both agree about is that we don't buy the story that, um, you know, because nothing can be demonstrated definitively, utterly, to be the case, there is no truth. I mean, I think we both believe that there are truths, things that are truer than other things. Mm -hmm. And indeed, if... if we certainly if, act that way. Well, well, we couldn't even talk, right. could we, if we didn't? Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, and even to say that um, there are no truths is itself a truth statement, mm -hmm. which is that it's truer than the statement there are truths. So everybody automatically has truths, whether they know it or not. Yeah, but and it's because you... Well, you, you said why. I yeah. don't think... It's not only that you can't talk, you can't even see, because no. right? you don't know how to point You your wouldn't eyes. know how to discriminate what's coming into your brain at right, all. Right. So uh, it's inevitable. Um, uh, I think we would agree about that. But I, I think there may be a slight point of difference between us in that I'm um, very willing to uh, embrace the idea of uncertainty. Mm -hmm. And I, 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 I may be wrong, perhaps you could expand on that. But sometimes you come across as as a man who has certainties that... Well, it's a peculiar kind of certainty. <laughs> I'm certain that standing on the border between order and chaos is a good idea. Good. And that's a weird exactly. certainty, eh? Because, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And that's that, you that, need that, to that, be in the sort of slightly unstable position. Yeah. Yes. You have to, you have to be, um, what would you say? Encountering as much uncertainty as you can voluntarily tolerate. Yes. And I think that's equivalent to Vygotsky's zone of proximal development. I, I'm and sure I that's also, right. So, so when we talked a little bit earlier about the idea of an instinct for meaning. Yes. So I think what meaning is, it's, it's, it's the elaborated form of the orienting reflex. But what meaning does, its function, its biological function, which I think is more real in some sense than any other biological function, is to tell you when you're in the place where you've balanced the stability, let's say, of your left hemisphere systems with the exploratory capacity of your right, so that not only are you master of your domain, but you're expanding that domain simultaneously. Yes, yes. And when you, I think that when you're there, yes. and it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a kind of a metaphysical place yes. in some yes. sense, that you're imbued with a sense of meaning and purpose, and yes. that's an indication that yes. you've actually optimized your neurological function. 